Okay. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is the evidence on the Budget Bill at Stage 2. This is intended to allow the Committee the opportunity to put questions on the Bill and the amendments um, that are made to the Bill and to, to the Cabinet Secretary and his officials before we turn to formal proceedings. And we're joined for this item by Derek Mackay, who's the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by Scottish Government officials John Nicholson, Deputy Director of Public Spending, Graham Owenson, who's the Head of Local Government Finance, and Aidan Greaswood, who is the Head of Tax Division in the Scottish Government. Um, I welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, and Cabinet Secretary, I invite you to make an opening statement. Okay, thank you, Convener. In relation to Stage 2 amendments that the Committee is considering today gives effect to the spending plans that announced in Parliament during uh, Stage 1 of the budget process. Uh, as I've announced, I will be providing an uplift of £90 million to local government as part of the budget deal agreed with the Greens. Uh, the amendments I'm proposing today allocate an additional £90 million to local government and an additional £4 million to the health portfolio in 2019-20. In addition, there are two further amendments which are necessary to increase the total size of the resources available in the Scottish Budget and to increase the cash authorisation level, both increasing by the £94 million figure to accommodate the changes that I've just mentioned. These increases are being funded from additional consequentials provided by HM Treasury as part of the UK supplementary estimate process which early last week the Scottish Government received a confirmation of the quantum of these consequentials and the flexibility to carry them forward into 2019-20. I hope that's helpful for the committee. Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I take you to our, our, the Finance, Finance and Constitution Committee's budget report, <coughs> in particular what we said, Cabinet Secretary, in regard to the Scotland Reserve? Uh, we said the committee recommends that the Parliament needs to give thoughtful consideration in relation to both this budget and future budgets about whether it may be prudent to begin building up the Scotland Reserve to deal with potential forecast error and where this money would come from. For example, whether building up the Scotland Reserve should be a priority in allocating any underspends. Um, Cabinet Secretary, our committee budget advisor told us that in the budget you're planning to draw down more from the Scotland Reserve than is currently in the Reserve. Can you explain how that's possible, please? Because the underspend that will be achieved in the current financial year transfers into the reserve, so I anticipate there have been more available uh, at the end of the process. That's only fully um, uh, determined after the uh, closure of, of the budget and is presented to Parliament in the usual way. So I anticipate in, uh, generating a underspend which then goes into the reserve, so that won't be the case. Have you got a number you can put in that, Cabinet Secretary? Not right now, because it's always a fluid position in terms of the underspend as you work your way through the financial year, but the, the final number is presented to Parliament in usual fashion. Okay, thank you. Murdo? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question about the uh, additional £148 million in Barnet consequentials uh, that you built into your budget um, uh, when you announced it in Parliament on uh, Thursday uh, last week. When you uh, came to the committee on the 16th of January, you were very clear at that stage that all the funds at your disposal were allocated. There were then uh, budget discussions which took place with uh, other parties, including the Greens, and then you were able to find, I think, an additional £90 million for local government in order to do your budget deal with the Greens. Um, have you phoned Philip Hammond to thank him for getting you out of a hole by giving you this extra money? No, but I will see the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in February where I'll raise, raise a, a range of matters of interest uh, to, I think I heard Adam Tomkins say raid. I would like to raid to the Treasury, that's certainly true, um, but I'll raise with the uh, Treasury a, a number uh, of matters of interest to Scotland, including um, the general financial um, position, preparations for Brexit, uh, a whole host of, of, of other uh, issues that I'll raise with the Treasury. Okay. When did you learn that you had an extra £148 million? Burns Day, as it happens, was Friday the 25th of January that I was first notified by officials that there may be the prospect of extra Barnet consequentials. The following Monday, my officials uh, sought clarification for Treasury. Of course, that was uh, the week of stage one of the budget. Uh, we required um, the detail because it's important to know where the resources are derived from uh, because that may have an impact on where they can be allocated to. 
uh, but that was on Friday the 25th of January, and I'm sure Murdo Fraser well appreciates that was after my committee evidence when I had said I had allocated every penny in the Scottish budget. These resources were not anticipated. Thank you. Um, why did you not tell Parliament you had this extra money? I did tell Parliament in stage one of the budget when I addressed um, the Chamber. Why did you not tell Parliament when you heard you had the extra money? Given that we were in a, in a situation where there were ongoing budget discussions taking place with the Green Party, indeed with other parties, why did you not inform other parties, indeed Parliament as a whole, that you had these extra resources at your disposal? That's a ludicrous question, as Murdo Fraser well knows, because I update Parliament and all the expectations around transparency. Officials look into the detail of the Barnet consequentials. That's what they did to ensure that we were um, a, in, sound, in a sound place to be able to allocate those resources in the fashion that I did. I have engaged with all political parties in relation to the budget compromise that was necessary to be found to ensure that the £42.5 billion budget could be approved. And as it happens, the Greens were the most constructive um, party in this Parliament in terms of the opposition engaging with the government. And as soon as I was able to, I informed Parliament. And as it happens, that was stage one of the budget. But you could, of course, have informed Parliament as soon as you became aware of the extra money. You could have had an inspired parliamentary written uh, question that you could have answered on, on Monday, the 28th of January. And what that would have done is allow all the other parties who were involved in budget discussions to be fully aware of the envelope of money available to you. It may be, it may be Mr. Mr Harvey, on behalf of the Greens, think he got a very good deal as a result of his negotiation because he got an extra £90 million for the local government. It turns out you had much more money than that. It turns out you may have much shortchanged Mr Harvey and the Greens. If he'd negotiated harder, he could have got uh, perhaps a bit more money. But you didn't tell the opposition parties you had this extra money available. How can we expect to have constructive and transparent negotiations around the budget when you're concealing from Parliament as a whole and from the opposition parties the fact you have these additional resources at your disposal? Well, first of all, Patrick Harvey, the Greens managed to secure a deal which was uh, better than any other opposition party it was trying to secure, including uh, the Conservative Party, who achieved zero, the Labour Party, who achieved meltdown, the Liberals, who achieved zero. So, in fact, I think there has been a constructive uh, outcome from the budget, and, of course, the alternative is that budget doesn't pass at all. In relation to transparency around the resources, I think it's quite... Um, effect of government. We hear about the potential consequentials. Officials probe it and I present it to Parliament within a matter of days. If I had received a parliamentary question, I would have answered honestly. I think that process would have taken um, much longer than the process that was undertaken, which is I reported it to Parliament and explained it, uh, how uh, the uh, budget concession was funded. Uh, incidentally, I've seen some press coverage at the, the weekend um, which is factually incorrect. Uh, I have proposed to use the uh, the health consequentials, of course, pass to health. That's, that's a matter uh, for the Scottish Government. Uh, but I've also earmarked resources for a teacher's pay deal. So it's not true to say that uh, resources won't be used. Actually, resources have been earmarked for the teacher's uh, pay deal, if that's uh, agreed. In terms of the parliamentary process and budget negotiations, it's up to other opposition parties what they bring to me, and I would contest that parties should maybe drop their um, uh, ideological obtuseness um, when they approach the uh, budget. If, the, if, if other parties want to engage constructively, they can help decide how we allocate um, resources uh, as well. So I think it's probably Murdo Fraser kicking himself on behalf of the Tories for not engaging in the process more constructively than otherwise could have done. Um, just, just one last question, Convener, if I may. Surely the opposition parties would be a bit more constructive in terms of the budget if you, as Cabinet Secretary, were not being essentially dishonest about the resources at your disposal and concealing from them and concealing from Parliament the extent of the spending envelope that might be available. And, you know, in the, in this committee, we've discussed as part of the budget review process many times this whole question of transparency of the budget process. This is a government that is anything but transparent. It's a government which is concealing from Parliament and concealing from those who are in good faith trying to negotiate the budget uh, the facts of the availability of funds to this government that might be able to be spent on the things that matter to everybody. Um, surely you need to reflect on this, Cabinet Secretary. If we can watch our language when we're going about it as well, I think that would be helpful. Convener, I'm happy. I think I've set out very clearly the uh, 
timeline in terms of officials hearing of the Barnet consequentials and how they've been deployed. How they are being deployed is now a matter for Parliament. I could equally throw back the question, for how long did Treasury know about the consequentials that the Scottish Government was entitled to that that information wasn't forwarded to me as part of the supplementary estimate of Barnet consequentials. I have no idea for how long they knew about these consequentials. When I was here at committee, I was asked, did I have any extra resources at my disposal as part of a budget deal? I answered honestly. That position changed as consequentials came to light. They've been deployed in the fashion that I've quite clearly set out to committee this morning to Parliament last week and in response to any inquiry that's been forthcoming. In many other parts of the budget deal is down to flexibility or policy concessions that have been made. So I've been honest, transparent, clear throughout. But I'll ensure that Scotland gets every penny it's entitled to and it's spent to ensure that this country has stability, stimulus and the sustainability of our public services in the face of chaos and adversity that's coming from Westminster. Neil. Yeah, um, for the, the question from Mother Fraser, could I therefore make a formal request, Cabinet Secretary, that in future, when you're given informed of Barnet consequentials from the Treasury to the Scottish Government, that you immediately inform Parliament and this committee of the Barnet consequences? Well, will you give that going forward? Will you give that commitment? Well, convener, why would the committee only be interested in some aspects of the budget process when we carry out the autumn budget revision, the spring budget revision, the medium-term financial strategy, the budget full scrutiny process. Are members not reading these documents? Because that's actually where I cover the revenue that the Scottish Government receives and raises and the expenditure. This information is all presented to Parliament. Maybe members should read the documents that I present to this committee. Very uh, briefly, I understand from what you've said, Cabinet Secretary, the additional Barnet consequentials would represent 0.005% of the total £42.5 billion. Was there any sense that you had from the negotiations with other parties that what was stopping you getting over the line with a deal was 0.005% of the total spend? It, well, I think... Uh the position from other parties. I wouldn't, I wouldn't reveal, because I, think, I don't think it's the right thing to do, to reveal what was said in the private budget negotiations, but most parties, indeed all parties, went public with their um, budget ass. Uh, in terms of the Conservative Party, it was drop independence. Same goes for the Liberal Democrats, and the Labour Party put forward a proposition that changed, and it depended who I was speaking to in the Labour Party as to what the proposition uh, was, and that's why I've arrived at a deal uh, with the Greens who engaged constructively. Uh, and in, in the end, that, that change of Barnet consequentials is a tiny part of the overall budget, because Parliament has to bear in mind what we've been asked to approve overall in the budget process is £42.5 billion of expenditure. And then, of course, there's the, the, the necessary revenue-raising elements. What stage two is looking at is the uh, essentially that uh, uh, figure uh, around the allocation to local government of £90 million and health, the additional £4 million. Um, I, it's fair to say I wouldn't get into the detail of the spending request from the other opposition parties because they couldn't get past their constitutional obsession. One, one other supplementary in this area before we move on to the area. Willie. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we shouldn't forget that Barnet consequentials are essentially Scottish taxpayers' money coming back to Scotland. It's not some gift or largesse from the UK Tory government. But has Mr Hammond ever phoned you, Cabinet Secretary, to thank you or thank Scotland for the billions that they rake in through tax revenues and things like whisky or oil and gas for decades? Have they ever done that? It's fair to say, Convener, I've got a pretty cordial relationship with um, Treasury Ministers. Is some are easier to deal with than others. I, I deal with um, Liz Truss. She's the Chief Secretary to Treasury. Uh, we've got something in common. We're both born in Paisley, um, which is of interest. Uh, Mel Stride is a, another financial minister in the Treasury. He's from uh, Kilbarkin or Kilmacombe, anyway, West Renfrewshire. So you see the Renfrewshire link in both Treasury and uh, Scottish Finance. But, you know, in seriousness... Um, we, uh, we, uh, I missed Adam Tonkin's commentary there. Uh, we, uh, we <laughs> I agree, convener. Um, we have a pretty cordial relationship. We, we, get, uh, we get on with business. I have asked, UK government has asked, 
Um, but no, I've never had a phone call thanking Scotland for its uh, large assets contribution to the Treasury. And equally, I don't see Barnet Consequentials as some sort of gift from a benevolent Chancellor. The Chancellor has wrecked austerity and impending economic self-harm upon the UK and Scotland. We've got nothing to thank them for right now. We move on to another area in Council funding. James Kelly. Uh, thanks, Convener. The deal that you've announced in relation to the £90 million pounds basically still leaves councils in a position of a, a cuts budget. So the overall position in relation to core funding is that council budgets will still be cut by £230 million. Pounds. Yeah. That's correct, isn't it? No, it's not correct, no. no well, the, bu the budget analysis uh, produced by SPICE shows that. Right, we'll pick a council. Are you saying SPICE are wrong? I I'm saying I've got my own statistics. I'm allocating real terms resource increases for... Scottish local <coughs> government, and if you want to pick a council, we can look at um, the increased spending power for individual local authorities. So are you saying that the SPICE figures are wrong? I'm saying if you discount the SPICE figures, as we've described before at both the Local Government Committee and the Finance Committee, if you take out actual cash, if you take out subjects of funding, childcare, for example, £210 million pounds invested in childcare. I see childcare as a core function of local government. But only if you start excluding actual cash, actual resources to local government, could you possibly come at a figure that says local government is getting less money. Fact, and Spice says this, local government is getting more money in resource and in capital. That was at draft budget in December. Now, I can go through council by council the increase that each council will enjoy as a consequence of this budget. Fact, Local authorities are receiving more money from Scottish Government. Fact. Local authorities are enjoying a real terms increase. Fact. Local authorities are getting a capital increase. I don't know how to say it any other way, convener. I put it to you, Cabinet Secretary, that you're living in a fantasy. Because the reality is that on the ground, if you go around, if you speak to any local councillors, including the SNP ones, the reality is that they're facing a situation where they're setting budgets where they're having to look at hard choices like cutting jobs, cutting services, closing leisure facilities. So to sit there and say that councils have got more money uh, is just a sheer fallacy. It's absolutely um, true. Would, would, would Mr Kelly wish to name a council and I'll tell you how much extra money they're getting? The, real, the reality is it's a cuts no, budget for anyone? councils. And that's what's, that's council? what's happening. That's what's happening any on council? the ground. Pick a that's council. What's happening on the, Alphabetically, that's what's if happening not even your own. The any council. Get, moving, moving on, convener. I bet we're um, moving on. Can you, can you explain why you choose to take £54 million pounds and stuff it down the ministerial sofa as opposed to allocate it to councils uh, to alleviate the cuts? That's a pretty incoherent question, but if what is meant by that is are any of the uh, Barnet consequentials been held in reserves for a, an unknown reason, they're not. I've said that we're allocating resources for the teachers' pay deal, which I expect will be a substantial amount. That pay deal is still to be agreed by the teaching trade unions. But you said earlier that you expected an underspend uh, this year. In fact, last year we know that the underspend was £454 million. Pounds. So you're expecting additional monies to come into reserves on top of that £54 million. In the previous financial year, the underspend was allocated to local government in the current financial year. In the current <coughs> financial year, I've outlined in the draft budget document that I'm fully allocating the resources uh, from the underspend to expenditure in 2019-20. What I'm anticipating is there'll be further underspend generating uh, this year, uh, partly as a consequence, of course, because of the last minute Barnet consequentials, and that's why HM Treasury's given me the agreement to relax uh, the limits around the fiscal framework and what can be carried forward. But I fully intend to allocate the resources. Uh, at, simultaneously, whilst being accused of not putting resources into the underspend, of course I've been asked uh, into the reserve why I'm not putting more resources into the reserve to prepare uh, by this committee to prepare for any potential tax reconciliation that, that might come. So, again, you'll have to look at these figures once we're at the point of publishing them, uh, but I'm very mindful of what the committee has suggested to me in your uh, budget scrutiny evidence. Of course, I'll respond to the uh, committee's report before stage three, convener. OK. Patrick. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, it's nice to be talked about so much this morning in the, in the committee already. Um, look, inevitably, this, this stage two discussion that we have um, involves, you know, a little bit of posturing and a little bit of positioning. 
uh, and some people want to say that the budget's terrible and the worst it could possibly be, and, and maybe you want to say that it's perfect and the best it could possibly be, and, and the truth is probably somewhere in between. But what we've got to in the process is a situation where in the final days and even hours before the stage one debate, uh, local government didn't really know what position it was going to be in. They've welcomed the, the changes that have been announced at stage one, uh, but they've been left in a, a great deal of uncertainty in the run-up to that while they were trying to uh, start to prepare their own uh, draft budgets at, at council level. You might wish that everyone agreed with your analysis that ring fence funds should all be counted as part of the same pot. You might wish that other political parties all engaged with constructive, costed proposals. But can I ask, what does the Scottish Government need to do differently in future to ensure that the process is a bit better managed, gives a bit more clarity, uh, and doesn't go down to the wire in this kind of last-minute, breakneck process that is no good for local government? I actually think there's some validity in that point. I would say, first of all, though, convener, that um, everyone who's familiar with the process will know from the point of the UK budget to the figures that we are running, the modelling that we are doing, and the pressures that we are faced with, we do have to move at breakneck speed to be able to produce uh, our own budget. And that's as a consequence of when the Chancellor's budget is, and that's been moving, of course, to presenting the Scottish uh, budget itself. So there is an issue about timing generally that I've raised with committee before. I think the, the budget process review group's given us a lot of recommendations and a helpful timetable for the budget process itself. But let's not lose sight of the fact that from the Chancellor's budget to the Scottish budget, a great deal of work is being done. Uh, comprehensive work. There are many moving parts to the budget through that process. And those figures change and actually can change in a substantial way. And then, of course, there is the figures that we provide to the Fiscal Commission to give us the uh, researched uh, position from our potential tax policy as well. So there are many moving parts. Where I think there's room for improvement is I've actually engaged with opposition political parties even earlier than my predecessor. If members recall what happened before. The draft budget was published and then there was the negotiations. And the negotiations carried between stage one and stage three. And sometimes, convener, and you'll remember this very well in a previous capacity, the budget deal was done at stage three in the previous minority government. For as long as I've been finance secretary, the deal's been done in advance of stage one. Well, there's the first difference. What I've also done that's different is engage with political parties well in advance eh, of stage one. So where I think there's room for improvement is if we have that discussion about genuinely what are parties looking for, what are their interests? Now, we now have an improved committee process where committees are giving recommendations and year-round budget scrutiny. But if parties wish to bring earlier their positions, their views, their options earlier, then I think that could be an improvement to the process. But I'm afraid what I've been dealt with is almost trying to drag out of politicians from the opposition parties what their position is post-publication of the budget. But I think we can engage earlier. I would welcome them that engaging earlier. And that may well, that may well convene a return to the point about what information could be shared at an earlier point. But I do say it's a very, very fast-moving situation right up to the publication of the Scottish budget because of the timescales that I have described. The point that you've, you've made about the, the UK timescales that you don't control, but you've also acknowledged that there's some, some validity in the question and that we need to, to be looking at what we can all do to uh, improve the process. It might be that, you know, if you, if you look at the, the UK government's approach to these things, perhaps Mardo Fraser is right and the, 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 the Chancellor lets all opposition parties at Westminster know Im immediately any kind of change in financial context is, is known to him, I, I suspect not, uh, but you know we can we can all look at how we might do these things better. One of the changes that you agreed in the stage one uh, debate was uh, a move to multi-year funding for local government. Would you agree that that discussion with political parties and with local government and others who who may have a view on it needs to begin well ahead of the next budget? Because if we're in a position next year of trying to agree a three-year funding settlement in the same breakneck way uh, that the, the last-minute budget discussions happened this year. That will be 
uh, an, an intolerable situation for local government to be in. Would you commit to beginning that discussion with local government and political parties as soon as the summer recess is over, so that the, the shape of that, the overall shape of that three-year settlement can begin to be negotiated and discussed well in advance of the publication of the budget? I could go further than that. I think with the, the government's current local governance review, I think it's an important part of that local governance review right now uh, in terms of the fiscal arrangements and the multi-year budget setting that we've described, because essentially it's, it'll be a rules-based, principles-based approach. So I see no reason that uh, we can't begin that discussion as part of the local governance review. Thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey, and then I've got a supplementary from Angela. Thanks, Bruce. I wonder if I could go back to the spice paper that was raised by James Kelly there, Cabinet Secretary. I presume it's the same paper that we're reading from. It says here in black and white, this is the spice paper. Finally, uh, one solely above and the capital budget is included. The total funding for local government now increases by 2.8% in real terms. And that's up 298.9 million pounds. That's up. That's not a cut in my reading of it. Could you clarify that? That's uh, no, that, I mean, that element of that line in the spice paper is absolutely correct. Um, and I've said before, it, you only get to a cuts figure if you reduce actual cash going to local government. Um, again, I have, a, I have a, a table that will show the full spending power of each local authority, including other elements as well. So, um, yes, that, that line uh, shows a real terms increase to local government. Maybe Willie Coffey has put it more eloquently than I have tried to explain it to Mr Kelly. I'll just to maybe ask you and invite you to show me these stairs, sure, uh, figures that, that, that you made the offer to James. Uh, I'll maybe invite you to let me see what East Ayrshire looks like. East Ayrshire's total council spending power increases by 4.91% and that's an increased support of £12.1 million. Pounds. Thank you. Angela. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Like other uh, members of this committee, uh, I received a copy of the letter that you sent to Councillor Everson, uh, the COSLA president, dated the 31st of, of January. Um, it's a fairly lengthy, uh, detailed letter in which uh, I think you set out a very uh, fair and balanced uh, characterisation of both uh, the opportunities and the challenges facing local government. And if I can uh, just read out one sentence that I think encapsulates that. It says, as a result of the continuing UK austerity cuts forced upon us, I know local authorities, along with the rest of the public sector, are still facing uh, some difficult financial uh, challenges. So the Cabinet Secretary will be familiar with the phrase uh, divide and conquer. So therefore, I wonder what opportunities does the Cabinet Secretary think there are for the two spheres of government in Scotland, uh, local government and Scottish government, uh, to present a more united front uh, to uh, overcome uh, and oppose austerity? And where are the opportunities uh, for the two spheres of government to work together on those longer term priorities? In terms of the political opposition, I think we should speak with one voice in opposing the continuation of UK austerity. I think that's very important and that's very powerful. The committee is aware, as I've described before, that excluding the health consequentials, there has still been a real terms reduction in resource to Scottish Government between 1819 and 1920. And it certainly, what has been given doesn't undo the £2 billion reduction over the 10-year period. So speaking with one voice to oppose that ongoing austerity is significant. And the major threat to our economy and our people right now is undoubtedly Brexit. And again, we should work together in both opposing Brexit, opposing the worst case scenario of Brexit, which is no deal Brexit, and work with local government uh, to oppose all of that. Then, if we are continuing to mitigate, we need to do two things, I think. It, first of all, is in absolutely growing our economy and working on the economy so that we can have that economic growth whilst tackling inequality at the same time and work with our partners and local government so to do. And second, secondly, around that provision of, of services and, and mitigation, continuing to work together in areas such as housing and welfare, welfare fund, uh, and the interventions that will make a difference at the local level and for some of the most vulnerable people in our society as well, whether that's around uh, early years expansion of childcare or some of the other interventions that we make. So focused on both um, the, the political charge against the UK government 
but mitigate mitigating and managing the situation as best we can with the powers that we have, but also uh, being able to uh, have that empowering relationship um, as well, where we can genuinely work together to achieve those outcomes. Okay, thanks, Kavira. I'll come back to some of the longer term. Do you want to just deal with that just now, then? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose what I'd be really keen to hear from, from the Cabinet Secretary is the, the, the examples in this year's budget where uh, there are you know, sound choices made with an eye to the future, you know, taking that, that longer term view. Uh, you've mentioned childcare. Um, you know, housing would be another ex example. Um, but you know, if you could perhaps say more about you know, the, the long term multiplier impacts of these choices. But, you know, again, looking at where are the opportunities um, to work with local government and others with a view to the longer term. You've also touched on multi-annual multi funding as well. I think, um, so there's the investments that we are making in partnership with local government. Housing is a good example because it's £826 million. Pounds. When I just looked at the, the statistics for my own area in Renfrewshire, you know, a thousand new homes will be built as a consequence of some of that investment. So that, that that's, of course, good news and, and welcome investment. So actual direct investment in infrastructure with local government as our delivery partners, key stakeholders, important. Uh, that is around housing, it's around childcare, making sure that we've got the, uh, the necessary buildings and staffing uh, and capacity to deliver on that commitment. So I think the investments we're making today is building for the future in both economic growth and a fairer society, giving children and young people the best possible start in life. Some of those resources, of course, are targeted through the Pupil Equity Fund, which empowers not just local authorities, that other sphere of government, but head teachers direct. So the empowerment agenda is just not about handing power to politicians, but, but to people as well. But the investment that the budget makes is absolutely investing in our capacity, the sustainability of today's services, but also the opportunities of the future. A further example would be around the uh, growth deals, which are you know, sitting next to Willie Coffee, of course. The Ayrshire growth deal has been approved at long last, £100 million from UK government, £100 million from Scottish government. So it's unlocking the economic potential, but absolutely focused on the opportunities that that creates. Um, I do actually want to see us work more closely with local government on local economic development. I've watched the Economy Committee, I've been a witness to the Economy Committee on Business Gateway uh, and more around city deals and other areas. So I think there should be um, further joint working with local government in areas such as economic development that I'm happy to take forward as Economy Secretary. Um, whilst there's a range of other specific investments, of course, that are part of the budget, sometimes, sometimes forgotten about, such as the um, uh, expansion of, of um, um, social security support in, in the next financial year as well, and free sanitary products, a continuation of the, the baby box, and then other grants that, that are administered by local authorities but will make a, a real difference uh, to people. So as I say, there's a range of areas that can work together. And I think that it's fair to say that um, in welcoming the budget progress, and the empowerment agenda, then there's further opportunities to work with local government going forward in, in some of this territory. Yeah, so just a final question, Community, you touched upon mitigation and obviously the Social Security Committee this morning um, published some work where, where they said it's not realistic or feasible for the Scottish Government to continue to uh, mitigate the UN uh, rapporteur on extreme poverty had uh, you know something to say about about this as, as well so how do the decisions that are made about the budget how do they support actually lifting people out of poverty as opposed to mitigating to hold people um, to keep people where, where they are so social security is about entitlement and a safety net, isn't it? It's about providing resources at people's time and need. But I'll tell you what drives me as finance and economy secretary. It is actually growing the economy. It is growing the economy because if we create meaningful, purposeful, properly remunerated employment, I think that's the best social and economic policy that exists. That's what I happen to believe, that that economic growth is, is material, materially significant and uh, is, is the antidote to that social 
um, exclusion. So I believe that the range of measures that we put in place to support the economy, as well as the sustainability of public services, is absolutely about improving the life chances of our people, as well as all the other programmes. I 100% support childcare, early intervention, family nurse partnerships, you know, all of that, health care, uh, health improvement, the preventative approach, all wonderful. But for me, growing the economy in an inclusive way is, is a fantastic way to address outcomes and to, to champion uh, inequality. And within the budget, there's £5 billion for infrastructure. As I say, £826 million of that is a uh, housing. Uh, there's more money to stimulate the economy. We're taking forward the National Investment Bank. There's the most competitive package of rates relief anywhere in the United uh, Kingdom. And there's investment in innovation, education uh, and business growth as well. So all of that is to help drive our economy to achieve the outcomes of both um, empowering people, improving life chances and providing the necessary safeguards and safety net that comes along with a social security system. But finally, convener, our ability to protect Scotland from the ravages of a right-wing, Brexit-mad um, government continuing austerity is at its limits. So investment decisions in Scotland are looked at through the lens of what will actually work to lift people out of poverty? Absolutely. The national performance framework and the purpose of our country is absolutely about the life chances of our people. Alexander. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I could talk about the, uh, the uh, car park tax uh, that you've brought in. And I should, uh, in the absence of any detail on it, uh, and as an employee and as an employer and as someone with a car and as someone who uses off-site parking, uh, I should probably declare an interest. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, and as a Tory, I'm sure you'll take the Conservative perspective on it. Yeah. Okay. Get on with the questions, please. Sorry. Uh, and I don't know if other members uh, will have similar, similar interest. Um, so I'm, I'm sure with everything else in the news, you have a Cabinet Secretary who must be thrilled how much attention uh, you know, this particular budget, budget item is receiving. Uh, and certainly the diversity of my inbox, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, concerning many constituents from you know, rural teachers uh, to students attending uh, college in Aberdeen, for instance. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's primarily a, a workplace tax and a, a couple of business questions. Um, which I'd be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could provide some clarity on. Uh, what one is that you know, if employers are, are paying uh, this workplace, workplace levy uh, on behalf of employees, uh, and this counts as a benefit in kind, or P11D, you know, there'll be some record of parking spaces uh, and use required. So I was wondering, has he given any thought to that, and, and who might have the dubious pleasure of maintaining a, a, a record, a register of every parking place in Scotland? Um, and secondly, um, you know, if a business property uh, is attracting a large parking levy, uh, this will obviously affect the rateable value. Uh, so is he also anticipating uh, another uh, round of uh, business rates appeals? So I just wonder if, you know, if he could provide some clarity or if he's given any thought at all uh, to some of the implications of what he's agreed. Well, convener, I'd refer members to the published <coughs> correspondence with the Greens on what has actually uh, been agreed. Of course, this power exists south of the border in Tory-run England, of course. I don't hear the Conservatives uh, arguing to scrap the ability for local authorities to, to have this uh, levy south of the border. But um, since we are um, focusing on this issue, I can only advise the committee that this is at an early stage. There is the agreement that an amendment will come <coughs> forward. Uh, in relation to this levy, and it will be considered there. I understand that the committee will take evidence on it um, uh, as well. So I, I don't propose to offer up any more detail because it's at an early stage. We've agreed in principle to accept a, an amendment that introduces a power for local authorities to take this forward. Uh, there will be consultation by that committee, as I understand it, and then the detail will be um, forthcoming. Uh, Michael Matheson, the Transport Minister, will lead on this issue, but in terms of the budget, there is an agreement that will accept the uh, amendment from the Greens uh, at stage two, and um, I will uh, happily share um, more information at that point in time, but this is at an early stage. If Mr Burnett wishes, you know, maybe he should uh, advise some of the correspondence that he's had in this matter of that, rather than scaremongering about who or may not be paying this levy. The Scottish Government did, of course, have one proviso that the NHS and hospitals would be exempt from this, as if there are other uh, exemptions or matters for local authorities to be considered, that will be considered in due course. But I think that maybe members shouldn't scaremonger on this, should work with Parliament in a constructive and collaborative fashion to ensure that we get a scheme that's right for the country, right for local authorities and right for local people. 
Uh, thank you. Now, you know, I know the Cabinet Secretary likes to you know, peek across the border uh, every time he's looking for a covering excuse, but I'm sure he's aware that the, you know, the, the levy down south was brought in I think, over 20, you know, nearly 20 years ago uh, by a Labour government. You know, it's only been implemented once uh, in a Labour council, uh, and that was uh, in conjunction with a, a, a tram scheme, I believe, that had been brought in. So I'm not quite sure of how useful a comparison uh, uh, the levy being uh, utilised down south is. But you know, is the truth not that you know, in Scotland, when business Businesses you know, need to be focusing on productivity. You know, you're just going to bring in an unworkable measure, uh, which even the majority of your colleagues don't support, uh, um, just to buy off the Greens. And if you were really serious about this proposal, you, know, you would have brought in something more than just an amendment uh, to a planning bill. There seems to be an absence in facts from <coughs> many members of committee, I must say, convener the, this morning. I should add that I think you'll find that um, the uh, budget deal that I have um, taken forward as a full support of the Scottish Government and uh, members of my own party uh, in relation uh, to the uh, in engagement and consultation. I think that will be helpful in, in, in taking forward um, the right policy in relation to business growth. As it happens, I met business representative organisations uh, yesterday, uh, which I'm sure the member would uh, welcome. Uh, and we did focus on a number of matters in relation to the budget and also growing our economy. And it's true to say, whatever people think about the uh, workplace levy, it is as nothing compared to the financial catastrophe that's coming our way as a consequence of Brexit, convener. And we can dismiss that, but it is a major threat to Scotland's economy. And that is what businesses are talking about and want clarity on right now. Thank you, convener. Neil. Thanks, convener. Um, just to follow on the questions from uh, Mr Burnett, um, you've just talked about the importance of growing the economy and how it's your, your top priority and you've said this is policy um, is at an early stage. Um, could, could you confirm then you haven't done any economic modelling or economic impact assessment of this policy? And you've talked obviously about the absence of facts. Would it not be beneficial for you to carry out an economic modelling and impact assessment on this policy given what you're saying about your number one priority? Is, is growing the economy. Uh, convener, I'm very familiar that opposition amendments can feature at stage two, even stage three uh, of the parliamentary process. That's the purpose of legislation working its way through Parliament. And of course, that precipitates uh, consultation and engagement. That's the parliamentary process. No, I haven't undertaken any individual economic analysis. Uh, the um, uh, Transport Minister will take this forward, Michael Matheson, as that's appropriate for that committee uh, and that power. Um, but it's now working its way through the parliamentary process. And convener, an important point here is this is about not a Scottish government scheme, but this is about empowerment of local government. It was a necessary budget concession um, because if there was no budget, the consequences were that a £42.5 billion budget for Scotland would have gone down. Uh, but ultimately, this is about empowering local authorities. And I do wonder why it is that some members who apparently previously were for local government empowerment and letting local councils decide in consultation with local people, local businesses, for local circumstances, accusing this government of being a big, bad, centralising government are now against localism when it is supported by a majority in the Scottish Parliament. I would encourage you to carry out an economic uh, assessment of, of, of this policy. Um, you said it's a matter for, for councils, um, or would be a matter for councils to decide whether they're going to use it or not. Of course, they may be forced to use it because of the, the poor budgets they're receiving. Um, in addition to not carrying out an economic modelling or impact assessment, I take it you haven't done an estimate of how much money would be raised by local authorities if it was applied, if the Nottingham model was applied across Scotland. There's no estimate of how much money would be raised by this policy. But Mr Bibby has no evidence to conclude that the scheme would be used by all 32 local authorities or the Nottingham uh, model. And I'm hearing Mr Bibby say the words could be. Well, we yeah. can model and scenario plan and do an economic analysis of a range of things that could be. Um, I, I actually agree with the need to consult and to engage, and that's something that I would certainly encourage both the Parliament and uh, local authorities to do before deploying any power. Uh, that may transpire. See, this is the beginning of the parliamentary process and there will be that uh, necessary engagement. Um, 
Again, Neil Bibby repeats the charge, as James Kelly has done in relation to budget settlements. I would simply argue that Renfrewshire Council spending power will increase by 4.59%, which is an increase of £15.1 million. Pounds. That's an increase uh, to local government resources in that area. Well, that's, that, that, that would be encouraging to hear if we don't see the cuts on the ground, Cabinet Secretary, and, and there's a whole series of cuts happening in Renfrewshire that you're aware of um, that you know, are a result of your budget cuts. But anyway, the, um, I want to go back to the, 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 the parking charge levy. What, what is your rationale for your support being contingent on exempting NHS workers but not other workers? What is your response to the EIS's call for schools to be exempt? What about police? What about firefighters? What about people on low incomes? What about apprenticeships? Um, what about workplaces with poor transport, for example? Workers in your constituency um, at the Leatherworks in Bridgie Weir have to start their shift at six o'clock, long before the first bus arrives to that community. Do you not think there's um, a case for looking at all uh, these issues before um, pressing ahead with your amendment? Uh, yes, I do, convener, happen to think that there's a case for further exemptions, and I do happen to think that local authorities should look very closely at local circumstances when taking this forward. That will be a matter for uh, local authorities. That's the point of local empowerment. And surely, I mean, Neil Bibby is demanding that Scottish Government empowers local authorities, passes powers to local authorities, and the very second that it's proposed, Neil Bibby and the Labour Party oppose it. Um, but I think there are further cases for local authorities, a certainly good case for local authorities, to look at exemptions in local circumstances, and of course all of that should be taken into account. Uh, teachers is a very good example. Um, if it's local authorities making the decisions, then uh, surely those councils will think about schools. There's an important uh, issue to address here, though, convener, that the charge isn't for individuals. The charge would be to, ultimately, the employer. Now, there is a question about which employers pass that on, but we mustn't immediately conclude that it is the individual staff member that pays the charge when, in fact, um, the, uh, the scheme should be about um, the uh, employer, the property owner, but these are circumstances that the decision makers and local government will take into account, subject to the safeguards uh, that we have insisted upon. Uh, yeah, thank you, I, I just wonder if we could take a little bit of the um, unnecessary party political heat out of this and have a slightly more um, uh, mature uh, conversation about it, um, a cabinet secretary. Uh, this is the finance committee. And we are interested in trying to understand tax proposals and trying to understand the, re the relation between tax proposals and other extant taxes in, in Scotland. You've been asked at least two quite detailed and I think quite intelligent questions about the tax implications of this proposal, both for uh, benefits in kind with regard to income tax and with regard to business rates and rateable values. And you, you haven't answered either of those questions. It might be that you don't have answers to those questions today, but if you don't have answers to those questions today, could you write, could you write to the committee in advance of stage three of this budget bill with answers to those questions? Because I think they are honest questions that are seeking to understand the tax implications uh, for other taxes that this committee has spent a long time looking at um, of, 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 of this proposal for what is, to all intents and purposes, a new tax in, in Scotland. And that, that isn't a party political question, and I don't really want a party political answer to it. It's a finance committee question, and I'd like a cabinet secretary answer to it, if I may. Well, I'm sure I actually have some sympathies with what Adam Tompkins is saying, and I'd ask him to reflect on the opening commentary from his colleagues, if you want to look at the language that's been deployed this morning, if you check the record. But I will say that in relation to the committee that will take this forward, uh, it will be the Rural Environment Connectivity Committee, and that's appropriate. The way this Parliament does its business is lead committees take forward the subject matter that's relevant to them, and that committee will take forward this particular levy because it's a, tra a transport uh, matter by the relevant Cabinet Secretary. In relation to the tax uh, outcomes, of course I'll engage with this committee, but I've tried to express to the committee it's the early stages of legislative uh, development. Stage two amendment that's to be brought forward on the basis of that detailed information will have more information to work with, and of course I'm happy to come back to the committee with those questions. But some members seem not to be listening to me when I say this is at an early stage, there's to be due a uh, consultation on the structure that's been taken forward so that we can actually analyse what is being proposed as opposed to the scaremongering that I'm reading about in the press. So I actually want to give Mr Tompkins the information that he seeks, but he'll understand the parliamentary process that takes us there. I, I, 
I'm grateful to the, to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and for, the, and for his tone. Could we have that information before stage three of the budget bill, please? Well, it, it's dependent on the stage two amendment, but I'll, I'll certainly endeavour to get that absolutely as quickly as possible, yes. Before stage three, thank you. If there's enough progress at the other committee and that then allows us to have that detail, then yes, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Yep. Willie, you've got a supplementary right, in this area so, as well. So on the same issue, convener, thanks very much. I mean, before we throw our hands up in horror at the, the workplace parking levy, could you confirm, Cabinet Secretary, that Cosla's President, Councillor Everson, said that she welcomed the commitment today to introduce that levy? It's right that local authorities across Scotland should be able to raise revenue locally to address local issues. Councillor Everson is a Labour member, I believe. Uh, well, even more interesting than that, Councillor Everson has uh, welcomed the progress uh, in the budget. And I know Mr Tompkins doesn't want me to be partisan, but I just want to show this is not always down to party colours. Gail McGregor is the Cosla Resources spokesperson who's also welcomed this, and she's a Tory. So it just goes to show it's not just your partisan position and it determines your view on this subject. Thank you. Patrick. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad there are some, you know, substantive questions about how these, these schemes might be designed at local level uh, rather than uh, just a, a knee-jerk reaction. But, uh, you know, given that there, there will be the opportunity for not just consultation on... Uh, uh, on how these schemes are, are designed, uh, but other potential exemptions beyond the NHS that the government has, has mentioned, uh, blue badge holders, for example, uh, you know, the, 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 the potential to exempt uh, employers who, who might choose to invest in subsidised public transport or in uh, other facilities to, that encourage behaviour change, and that this is all about uh, the, the very necessary change in the way that we move about that needs to, needs to be brought about and the incentives uh, around that. But surely the question for Parliament uh, in considering whether to pass legislation like this is very much the same as the, as the tourism uh, levy, the, the, the transient visitor levy. It's not whether one single model should be imposed across all of Scotland because absolutely nobody has suggested that. The question for Parliament is should local councils be as they are now, effectively forbidden from even considering whether they can design a scheme that suits their own local circumstances, or should they be given the flexibility? Yeah, the convener, I think that's a fair analysis of the argument between uh, the Parliament determining the framework and how much flexibility a local authority has. Um, Scottish Government set out uh, a, our position in principle, and as I've described, we will work through a what uh, a what. Um, local authorities may well propose. So I think there's an accurate uh, description there about the dichotomy we face about parliamentary control versus local discretion. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm interested in health and health budget, and uh, I remind committee that I am a nurse, although I'm not practising right now. But I'm interested in whether the Cabinet Secretary could provide some uh, information about what the budget means for health spending and perhaps the £55 million of additional funding which was to be provided um, uh, to make up for the shortfall of the Barnet consequential from what had been promised previously by the UK government. The Cabinet Secretary said in chamber that the UK government has now confirmed further unexpected funding in Barnet consequentials this year. So perhaps you could set out how much that is and if this makes up for the initial shortfall and how much of, a, how much of an increase in the NHS funding can we see for the Scottish Health Service um, previously to when you mentioned in December. Okay, so the Burns Barnet uh, consequentials uh, are £59 million. Of course, we pass every penny on to the health service in terms of resource consequentials, so that is indeed the case. That makes up for the £55 million uh, shortfall that I had previously identified that was committed to the NHS uh, by the UK government. Uh, so that, if you like, uh, reinstates uh, that amount. And actually, based on my uh, December budget, increases the health line by uh, four, four million pounds. That's what I'm asking committee to approve today at stage two. Uh, in terms of the overall um, funding to the National Health Service, uh, it'll be an increase in health resource funding by 729 
million pounds in 2019-20. This is a 754 uh, more than inflation since 2016-17. Funding for frontline NHS boards will be increased by £430 million, that's 4.2%. As I say, all resource consequentials will be passed on uh, to the health service. The total resource spending on health and sport will now be £13.9 billion. Over £700 million of investment in social care and integration, increasing investment in health and social care partnerships to over £9 billion. There will be an increase direct in mental health services by a further £27 million, taking overall funding in mental health to £1.1 billion and will invest a quarter of a billion pounds to support mental health measures for children and young people. Uh, incidentally, the Sports Scotland budget will be increased by £1 million to £32.7 million. Okay, thanks. I was going to ask you actually how the detail for the delivery, but I think you've uh, answered my question. Thank you. Okay. In that case, Tom. Thank you, convener, uh, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in a little over 50 days, the UK is set to leave the European Union. Um, and I think one of the important lessons of history over the past century is how disasters and catastrophes can happen, how we can be warned that they could happen, but there's a cosy consensus and a belief that it's impossible that such an event could prevail and we sleepwalk into such circumstances. In recent days, it's been reported that members of the cabinet believe there should be, UK cabinet believe there should be daily warnings about in public uh, media about the dangers of no deal. Plans formulated in the Cold War to evacuate the Queen have been dusted off in the event there was um, civil unrest in London. You previously mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, that this budget could, may have to be revisited in the event of a no deal. Given that this is a growing danger and is now moving from uh, the realm of the speculative to the possible and perhaps even the probable, can you outlay exactly what the consequences would be of a no deal for this budget and the fiscal position of Scotland? Uh, well, convener, I have a great deal of information in this regard, uh, but to sum it up, the uh, the Chancellor set out that his budget, so the block grant uh, consequentials uh, that come to Scotland, so that, that element of the budget, indeed the tax decisions, the relative elements, so the Chancellor's budget was contingent upon an orderly Brexit. So therefore, uh, my budget is also contingent upon an orderly Brexit. So we know that overall any form of Brexit harms the economy, means lower living standards, it means less GDP growth than we otherwise would have had uh, for a range of reasons. If there's a no-deal Brexit, that's pretty catastrophic because we know there's short, medium and long-term economic and social impacts of a no-deal Brexit. So it would have a detrimental impact on the UK and Scotland's finances, it would have a detrimental impact on our economy, a detrimental impact uh, on our population. So it would require us to revisit the Scottish budget because you couldn't just, I mean this £42.5 billion pound budget, it couldn't just continue in its current form following an no-deal Brexit because of the impact in the economy, uh, the, the, uh, the um, turbulence there would be, the impact in society, the increasing demand in our services. Um, and I would characterise, so there is a, the Scottish Government's Resilience um, Forum meets every week, it will meet again this week. Um, I'm focusing uh, economy ministers uh, on our actions to, to mitigate some of this damage. Hopefully it can be averted, but unfortunately it feels as if the likelihood of a no-deal Brexit is increasing as a consequence of the Prime Minister and their Cabinet's mishandling uh, of the situation. So we would need to revisit the budget, but I have to say it won't be with good news. It will be with necessary reprioritisation to try and manage the catastrophic economic and social consequences that will come from that outcome. I appreciate that, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wonder if, if you agree with me that such an outcome would uh, disproportionately disadvantage the most vulnerable in our communities. Yes, it will, absolutely. I mean, it's all right for some of the elite at the top who have been driving the propaganda around Brexit. They've feathered their own nest. They are sorted. It is the people that are most exposed, um, that are most vulnerable. Those maybe on lower salaries, those uh, um, struggling to balance the books, um, who will be impacted in this as well, of course, as many, many other uh, citizens. So it will have a profound impact. And my uh, concerns about it include uh, the, 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 the fiscal impact, but also um, employment, uh, productivity, um, 
the, the general wealth and well-being of our economy will all be impacted by a no-deal Brexit. Um, and then you can see publicly parts of the public sector um, pursue um, additional resources even because of the threat of Brexit. Now I'm referring to the police, for example, who are concerned about um, a public disorder in the event of Brexit as well. So uh, I don't think we should underestimate the serious impacts that might be inevitably heading our way. Uh, because of the handling, as I say, of the UK government. So it's catastrophic. We want to avert it. There is still a way uh, out of this mess, as has been explained by uh, the First Minister, Michael Russell, and his position. Uh, but we are looking at how we best mitigate this situation. Uh, but as I say, I'm very closely involved in it as Finance and Economy Secretary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, two weeks ago, we had in the chamber what I thought was a very uh, useful, uh, perhaps, um, very worthy um, debate on um, the budget as a result of one of the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group, in which committee conveners talked about their committee's um, priorities for the budget. I thought it was a useful contribution to the to the budget process. Of course, that revised budget process is, in, is infused with um, uh, a value of transparency. Um, so I want to ask you, in the same spirit as my earlier question, a couple of questions about transparency and the transparency of the budget process this year. First, it's been claimed in the press, and I don't know if this is true or not, because it's been claimed in the press, but that, that, that some £92 million has been made available to the Scottish Government to help um, Brexit preparations, but that these have not been spent on Brexit preparations, but have been absorbed into the Scottish Government's overall budget. Um, and a contrast has been drawn with the way that money has been spent south of the border, where uh, local authorities and the police have been handed money for Brexit preparations, but that has not ha apparently happened in Scotland. In, in the light of the principle of transparency of the budget process, is there any light that you can shed on that, Cabinet Secretary? So the current position is that any Barnet consequentials that I have received have been allocated, as I've described earlier in the budget. I think I've been quite clear about that. There is work streams ongoing about um, Brexit um, preparedness and Michael Russell leads on that work. I haven't created a separate fund, so I haven't carved out a separate fund for the police or for local authorities. They engage in uh, the resilience meetings we're convening uh, at the moment. As I say, if there is a no-deal Brexit, we have to revisit the budget, uh, but uh, there have been allocations of a um, civil service resource to deal with Brexit, but no, I haven't separate in full transparency, I haven't separated out a fund to say, and there's a pot for one service and there's a pot for local government. The resources are fully allocated by the budget that I'm proposing. If members have a contrary view to proposing it in this fashion, they can certainly put that forward. So what, what, what's the reason then for taking a different approach with that funding from the approach that you've taken with regard to um, Barnet Consequentials for Health? Because you very clearly said, you said it again uh, this morning, that health consequentials will pass to health. So why are, as it were, Brexit consequentials not passing to Brexit? Uh, health consequentials are a manifesto commitment that will pass on all resource NHS consequentials to health. Um, Brexit in a, doesn't have such a, a manifesto commitment, of course, because of the chronology events. But I don't hypothecate, I don't ring fence, I don't generally photocopy the Chancellor's budget in terms of allocations or Barnet consequentials that would come our way. We have that a flexibility to allocate as we see fit. We are working on our Brexit preparations right now. As I say, Michael Russell is leading um, that piece of work. Um, and that includes partnership with local authorities and police who are involved in our resilience meetings. Um, and uh, on the same theme of transparency, um, uh, as I understand it, um, there was no deal to pass the budget at stage one until the day of the stage one debate, which was Thursday of last week. But you knew um, from the beginning of that week about the £148 million of Barnet consequentials, of additional Barnet consequentials that the Chancellor had uh, made available uh, to you. Do you agree that it is not consistent with the principle of transparency that underpins the work of the Budget Process Review for um, uh, negotiations about budget to proceed um, with you knowing, with any Cabinet Secretary knowing, that he or she has £150 million of public money in his pocket that he has not disclosed to Parliament? No, I disagree. I mean, there's many moving parts to the budget. The numbers clearly change into part of a £42.5 billion pound budget. The numbers on many areas change day by day, day by day. And I report to Parliament more 
uh, in a more um, uh, comprehensive fashion than previous finance secretaries because we've now built in further elements of accountability. The medium-term financial strategy is to name one a new development in the process. If opposition parties engage with me constructively, I can have that um, dialogue with them about choices, available resources, funding and flexibility and work on the art of the possible. So I totally disagree uh, that uh, I've been anything other than transparent, upfront and constructive in trying to get a budget through. And when the parliamentary um, uh, opportunities come, I present the fiscal position to Parliament. But transparency is a value that can be trumped by expedience? Not at all. Okay, I think that now concludes the, that part of the process, and we now turn to agenda item two, the formal proceedings of stage two of the Budget Scotland Bill. So let me begin. The question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 2, 3 and 4. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Move. I have nothing further to add, Convener. Do members wish to contribute to this stage? James Kelly. Yeah, just to indicate, uh, clearly these amendments bring additional money into the budget. We're not going to oppose them. I understand the process and that we can't take a a vote on the overall position of the budget at stage two, but just to place on record that Scottish Labour continues to oppose the budget uh, on four, point, on four uh, counts. Uh, councils face, as I said earlier, face cuts, and the reality of that, if Mr Mackay looks to the ground, he can see the, the choices that they're having to make. I also believe that in terms of poverty, as a Fraser of Allender Institute blog pointed out, the budget... Uh, only allocates 27 mil million directly to help low-income families, so I think it's short on that. Uh, and, and, uh, additionally, on rail services, uh, as we saw yesterday, over the past year, thousands of services uh, have been cancelled, and the budget does nothing in terms of addressing the fares increase that uh, rail passengers saw earlier in the month. And finally, on the point of fair taxation, uh, Mr Mackay mentioned earlier in a, a previous contribution, he spoke about the elite at the top. Um, I think a, a proper progressive fair taxation policy um, should be asking the elite at the top to make more of a contribution to face the scale of the crisis that the country faces. Um, we're in formal process, Cabinet Secretary. You will get the chance to wind up, but I'll put other members in first. Patrick? Uh, thank you, Convener. Just to put a few comments on the record. Uh, these amendments, together with the additional flexibility that's been provided uh, in local government spending, do not achieve perfection, but they are substantial changes which have been welcomed by local government in Scotland. Uh, I've already spoken to, to colleagues in local government from a number of different political parties uh, who are clear that they will be able, be able to prevent extremely damaging cuts that were under contemplation as a result of these changes. I only wish... Uh, that all political parties were focused on the actual amendments they can secure, the changes that they can secure in the budget process. I think if all political parties did that, we'd actually see a, a better outcome for Scotland and we'd see a, a parliament that asserted its will more effectively. Angela. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, there is no silver bullet to addressing poverty uh, or improving the, the life chances. But if I can just mention uh, what I consider to be the biggest piece uh, of uh, the jigsaw uh, in terms of lifting children out of poverty, and that's actually the sustained investment in housing, which uh, for this year alone, or for the, the forthcoming budget, is £826 uh, million. Um, we have also uh, seen multi-annual funding of resource planning uh, assumptions uh, to local authorities of £1.75 uh, billion. Pounds, and that investment in housing, um, hard and fast, uh, can be demonstrated. It is good for the economy. It will grow the economy. It will support employment. Uh, it will create uh, warm and affordable homes for families uh, and is an all-round uh, good thing. OK, Cabinet Secretary, wind up. Just a few points, convener. First of all, it's wrong to say that this is anything other than a real terms growth budget for local government. Actually, the spending power, I'll give you the figure, the spending power in total 
for local government, including the amendments now, the total spending power for local government is up by £620 million in financial year 1920. That's an increase. And as I say, there's a real terms increase in resource and capital. On the issue of poverty, because I think it's important and reference has been made to the budget lines that target poverty, I think you have to look at all interventions as to how they support increased uh, equality. So that includes the Scottish Welfare Fund, Fair Start Scotland, Powering Communities Fund, Fair Food Fund, Digital Skills Training, Educational Maintenance Allowance, uh, Affordable Homes, Child Care, Carers Allowance, Concessionary Fairs, Bus Services Grant, Home Energy Efficiency Programmes, Carers Allowance Supplement, Baby Box and Free Sanitary Products. Just some of the examples that this uh, budget provides in terms of supporting poverty and inequality. Uh, convener, this was about stage two amendments of the £94 million pounds, uh, increase, the £90 million pounds to local government and £4 million pounds to NHS, which adds to the figures that I announced in the December uh, budget presentation. But Parliament did indeed have a choice. It had a choice in revenue raising as well. Some party, uh, the Labour Party, asked me to increase uh, income tax. I didn't get a costly proposition, uh, but asked me to increase higher rate and top rate. A top rate would have lost money. It had to increase um, a higher rate, as I say, by about 6%, 6 percentage points. Uh, the Greens asked me to raise income tax and non-domestic rates. I haven't done so. I found an alternative way uh, to meet the, the, the necessary budget requests of the Greens and the concessions therein. The, uh, the Conservative Party asked me um, to, to cut tax for the highest earners in society. I think I've got the balance right in revenue raising and spending commitments to stimulate our economy, provide stability uh, and sustainability for our public services. Um, in the face of adversity and austerity and Brexit chaos, I think it's a budget that's very strong, very good um, for Scotland and with the added amendments, I think, strengthens it um, further. So I would ask the committee to support these amendments. Okay. The, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed or well agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary is to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I already debated Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary is to move formally. Moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 3 agreed or well agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Schedule 1 be agreed, or we all agreed? Yes. We're all agreed. The question is that Section 2, Schedule 2, Section 3 and Schedule 3 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to, are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that sections 5 to 11 be agreed to, are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that a long title be agreed to, are we all agreed? We are agreed. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Um, I thank the witnesses for the, the session this morning. I now move into private session. <laughs>